Our second speaker this morning is Dr. David Gushy, who is the Distinguished University Professor of Christian Ethics and the Director of the Center for Theology and Public Life at Mercer University. He's also the author of many volumes and also is a public commentator on issues of faith and public life for such as the USA Today and the Huffington Post. And he has a new book, The Sacredness of Human Life, that you can find a sale here at the Urban's table. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Gushy. If no one else would leave, I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you. I am uh, very grateful to be here, and uh, those of you who have uh, survived to the near end of this conference, uh, thank you for staying. Um, grateful to uh, Jeff Greenman and George Colonsis uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to have some fun. I hope, hopefully, we'll all have fun, and you'll be able to tell all the people who left uh, the fun that they missed. Um, <laughs> I was given a specific assignment. And that was, I'm quoting my uh, invitation letter, discuss some specific social political cases in current debate based on my hands-on experience with these issues. I am the, quote, nitty gritty, I like that, I'm the nitty gritty speaker who brings the broader reflections of the conference to bear on the issues of this moment. Uh, this is a daunting assignment and I would like to jump right in, but I do, I do need to say a few preliminary words and then I'll, I'll go into some issues. I believe that evangelical Christians suffer greatly from the lack of a social teaching tradition, um, the kind of tradition that one can find in Roman Catholicism and in ecumenical Protestantism. In Catholicism, the social teaching tradition, though it has very deep roots, really begins with a series of papal social encyclicals beginning in 1891. The first papal encyclical uh, spoke about the unhappy condition of labor in unregulated market economies. And, to, and for 120 years, the Catholic social teaching tradition has been building on this heritage. And you can study these documents. They're very rich. Ecumenical Protestantism also has developed a body of social teaching. This is especially visible in the documents emerging from the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches. Also just over 100 years old, this ecumenical body of social teaching does function as a tradition. It's accessible both in terms of a body of documents and a series of themes and concrete issue declarations related to major social problems in the modern world. Ecumenical Protestantism was also blessed by a series of authoritative and widely recognized uh, theologians and ethicists in the 20th century, notably figures like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Martin Luther King whose writings themselves are part of the ecumenical Protestant social teaching tradition to this day. By contrast, evangelical Christianity lacks a similar authoritative body of social teaching. Certainly evangelicals can and sometimes do look back to leading thinkers or documents in their respective traditions, either back to early days in the church or back to Luther or Calvin or Wesley or back to the Anabaptist forebears. Some American uh, evangelicals will look back to the 19th century evangelical, uh, you know, uh, abolitionists and so on. Um, or if we decide to start the story with the World War II era birth of neo-fundamentalism, then the story begins with people like Carl Henry and then uh, thinkers like Francis Schaeffer or the social statements of the National Association of Evangelicals. But in all honesty, one could not really describe this as an evangelical social teaching tradition that compares to the other two that I have mentioned. We could continue to push forward in time. We might suggest that the Christian right has offered an evangelical social teaching tradition. But who would really suggest that the scattered speeches and pamphlets and books of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and James Dobson offer a usable, substantive social teaching tradition that has 21st century staying power? I'm trying not to smile. Um, <laughs> Um, or that the resolutions passed by the National Association of Evangelicals or the articles published in Christianity Today offer a social teaching tradition for evangelicals. To some extent, still dissertation writers today pore over the resolutions of the NAE and the essays or editorials in CT to see what evangelicals were thinking in 1963 or 1968. 
um, but these are not a social teaching tradition. Or perhaps we look to the evangelical left as David Swartz did in his excellent recent book, Moral Minority, which all of you should read. And he suggests that, a, or we could suggest that a social teaching tradition can be found in the works of people like Mark Hatfield and Jim Wallace and Ron Sider. Probably Ron Sider has gone the furthest in attempting to develop and broker a body of documents, books, essays, uh, declarations, that might constitute an evangelical social teaching tradition but um, I think that it's not quite there yet. In my own work over the last 20 years, I have been aware of the absence of a coherent evangelical social teaching tradition and have in some ways been attempting to offer elements of one and to cooperate with others whose work can also or has been contributing constructively to it. In my dissertation, Righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust, I work inductively from the example of Christians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust to propose what amounts, I guess, to a social ethics of costly, practical solidarity with the oppressed. In our textbook, Kingdom Ethics, Glenn Stassett and I propose a social ethic rooted in the teachings of Jesus and seeking to participate in a kingdom ethic which we identify with seven marks, which many generations of students have now had to memorize. Um, and those seven marks include uh, deliverance of the oppressed, justice, peace, healing, restored community, the experience of God's redemptive presence and joy. In the future of faith in American politics, I suggested that evangelical public engagement in the US now falls into conservative, liberal, and moderate camps and argue for what I called an emerging evangelical center with a broad range of issue concerns and a fierce political and ideological independence. And in my new Sacredness of Human Life book, I claim that the best rendering of the central norm of the biblical and Christian ethical tradition is a comprehensive sacredness of life ethic. This latter book breaks out of the evangelical subculture more than my other books since Righteous Gentiles, and it links my version of Christian ethics both to the Catholic moral teaching tradition and to the social justice ethic of ecumenical Protestantism. I continue to hope for the emergence of a coherent, robust evangelical Christian social teaching tradition. I do fear that evangelical biblicism, anti-institutionalism, and ideological fragmentation will continue to make the development of such a tradition a very difficult achievement. Lacking such a tradition, I will offer my issue-specific reflections in the comments that follow based on the rudiments of the Christian social ethic I have outlined just above. So, a reminder then, I want to offer an ethic that in every case stands in costly practical solidarity with the oppressed, reflects plausible participation in the marks of the reign of God, engages a broad range of issues, remains politically and ideologically independent, and treats each and every human life as ineffably sacred. I've decided to spice things up a bit by trying to treat as many important contemporary is policy issues as I can in the time given me. <laughs> um, I will therefore spend 400 words on 10 issues each. Um, <laughs> beginning with abortion and going to women's rights. Let's see if I can get, if I can get to them. Um, I have to tell you that in the invitation letter, it said, you are invited to don the mantle of prophet. I love that, that's so cool. Um, so, uh, uh, only God can judge whether there are prophets around, but uh, I will attempt to tell you exactly what I think, avoiding equivocations and politically safe hedges. Um, and I will say this, uh, partly in response to what I, I heard yesterday, um, policy matters as well as church. Um, uh, how, uh, how any nation constructs its laws and implements them matter, matters. And that the actions of my nation matter to me, um, precisely because I am a Christian loyal to the Lordship of Christ. Um, the Christ who has placed me in this country as my nation where I live. And so uh, I hope you will hear, um, uh, uh, getting, I'm getting down in the weeds on policy to some extent. And I'm gonna say we, and when I say we, I will be talking sometimes about the church and sometimes about the US because both of those identities matter to me. And that can be fun to criticize later if you would like. All right, <laughs> so uh, abortion. Though the precise moral status of embryonic and fetal life is not clearly established in scripture, 
The early Christian movement treated both abortion and infanticide as child murder, and as such, utterly incompatible with Christian discipleship. But the church also taught a sexual ethic that restricted sex to marriage, an ethic of hospitality for and solidarity with unwanted people of all types, and an ethic of economic sharing. Those who would practice all of those elements of an ethic today would not often feel the need for abortion because they would have sexual relations only in contexts in which children could be welcomed. Or if they did face crisis pregnancies, they could find Christian communities that could lovingly travel the journey through pregnancy with them. And they would never have to abort due to lack of access to the economic or healthcare resources necessary to sustain a pregnancy or raise a child. The ethos I am describing, that lovely ethos that I just painted the picture of, does not describe very many of our churches. And it certainly does not describe modern US culture. Here we do not restrict sex to marriage, we do not stand in solidarity with unwanted people, and we do not participate in adequate economic sharing. And because it is women rather than men who get pregnant, legal access to abortion in a society like ours became a non-negotiable demand of the organized women's movement in the 1960s especially. For 40 years, abortion on demand has been our cultural practice despite nods in the law toward a more restrictive stance. Despite ever stricter symbolic anti-abortion legislation passed recently by states such as Arkansas and North Dakota, I believe, it is hard to imagine that the basic structure of federal abortion law will be changed anytime soon. And if it isn't changed, then state laws are just symbolic gestures. My efforts on this issue over these years have been based on the observation that our society has become dependent on abortion to underwrite our libertine sexual practices and our individualist libertarian social and economic practices. While consistently defending the position that the sacredness of human life extends into the womb and that our abortion laws do not adequately protect fetal life, I have focused on addressing the cultural sources of our dependence on abortion, 1.2 million a year, and on practical abortion and reduction measures that can be pursued by individuals uh, churches, policymakers, and civil society. These include emphasizing sexual responsibility rather than freedom, including the responsibility to use contraception properly if one intends to have sex but not make a baby, strengthening the permanence of male-female sexual relationships, especially marriage, and providing social supports for those facing crisis pregnancies. Rolling back Roe v. Wade is not enough. The goal here is less and less and finally no more killing of the unborn because we don't need it anymore. The best means to get there is a practical question requiring careful and realistic analysis. Good so far? Okay, creation care. <laughs> I've had the privilege of being involved in evangelical creation care efforts since I began working on the staff of one of my mentors, Ron Sider, in 1990. It has been exciting to watch these originally marginal efforts begin to go mainstream over these two decades. Well before there was any discussion of climate change or Al Gore made his movie, long before that, the essentials of evangelical creation care were well established. A combination of the retrieval and recasting of biblical theology related to caring for God's creation, together with serious attention to contemporary environmental science. Not to mention falling in love with creation again. Together, these teach both that this is God's glorious, resilient, and life-sustaining creation, and that God's creation is indeed vulnerable to the damaging human mistreatment that we mete out to it. To get there, evangelicals have had to do some important theological and ethical work. We first had to retrieve a theology of creation and integrate it into our salvation-heavy, often otherworldly theology. Then we began to see that it's not just a theology of creation that we need, but a more cosmic theology of creation, fall, redemption, and eschatology. In other words, it isn't just that God created the world and we need to care for it, but also that God's project on the planet has never been just about human beings, but has always involved relating to and acting to redeem the entire cosmic order. This has integrated nicely into biblical work, for example, retrieving the ecologically rich shalom teachings of the Old Testament as well as a broad kingdom ethic in the New Testament, leading to an eschatology of renewal rather than the destruction of creation. And evangelicals have had to come to terms to some extent with contemporary science. 
If the global scientific community tells us that we are altering and or damaging creation, whether in terms of massive species losses or fishery depletion or coral reef damage or even climate change, then we must take those claims seriously, never uncritically as if science is infallible, but always seriously as if science has a particular role to play, a particular calling in monitoring and theorizing the health of God's creation. My encounters with great scientists like E.O. Wilson and climatologists like Judith Curry, also having been raised by a rigorous environmental scientist, my own father, have given me a deep and informed appreciation of the gifts and the limits of the scientific method. Certainly evangelicals need to listen closely to the research of the scientific community, including our own evangelical scientists, and not stop up our ears on the basis of, say, an outmoded theology of human dominion or an oddly ahistorical belief in the supposed imperviousness of creation to human maltreatment. We can't do anything bad to the earth because God's in charge. That's really bad theology. Um, <laughs> the death penalty. The US retention, <laughs> you ready? Shall we go? 400 words? Stay with me now. Let's go, all right? I'll tell you, I told you this would be the funnest session. This is so far, okay. All right. The death penalty. The U.S. retention of the death penalty places us at odds with our peers in the modern Western world and probably reflects our relative innocence of massive unjust governmental killing on our soil and the continued influence of unfiltered Old Testament death penalty law, unfiltered either by reading what the Talmud says or by reading uh, through a Christ-centered ethic. It is certainly instructive to note that any map of US states retaining and especially those broadly employing the death penalty tracks rather closely with high levels of religiosity and especially southern white religiosity. I'm talking about my people here. Um, <laughs> I've become convinced that a Christian social ethic that leans into the inaugurated reign of God cannot ultimately abide the state practice of killing a small select number of criminals even murderers from among the universe of murderers that we unfortunately produce every year in this country. My position is informed by the early church's revulsion against violence, including state violence, by the massive misuse of the state power to kill, especially in the 20th century, by the manifest and obvious injustices in the US application of the death penalty, which remains essentially arbitrary, though tied to systemic racial and economic injustices, and by the near total rejection of the death penalty in contemporary Catholic and ecumenical social ethics. I do understand that a sacredness of life argument can be made in favor of the death penalty, and this is precisely what appears to be happening in Genesis 9-6. I also can see how practical solidarity with the oppressed can lead one, and must lead one, to sympathy not just with people on death row, but also with cruelly murdered people and their bereaved families. And I know that Christian ethics, even in ethics of the inaugurated kingdom, must come to terms with the extent to which the world is not yet redeemed and the extent to which evil must still be restrained by the hand of the state. But a robust theology of sin extends to include the sins of the state in its bungling of and misuse of its ultimate power, the power to kill. This ultimately shapes my, use, my opposition to the use of the state power to kill when there is any available alternative, as there is in our criminal justice system. I also believe that those who enter into concern about the anachronistic survival of the death penalty also need to engage other abuses in our criminal justice system, including the overuse of solitary confinement, the continued role of racism, the terrible powerlessness of those lacking adequate legal representation, and the way that those who have been imprisoned are so often disenfranchised for life both in terms of civic rights and any kind of economic opportunity. Economic justice. Probably the central theme of both ecumenical and Catholic social teaching in the past century has been economic justice. The context has been the paradox of modern capitalism. Listen to me closely here. You're going to hear some new notes, maybe. The paradox of modern capitalism, which over its four-century run has proven to be both an engine of unimagined economic growth and prosperity for its winners and an engine of terrible economic injustice and poverty for its losers. That is individual, corporate, and national on both sides, winners and losers. 
Modern Christian social ethics was born in response to modern capitalism, especially in response to the manifest cruelties which inspired the Marxist critique that by the late 19th and early 20th centuries threatened to delegitimize capitalism altogether. Of course, we know what happened. The Russian and Chinese empires eventually chose communism, which turned out to produce regimes of mass poverty, a wealthy governing elite, and unimaginable mass killing to keep everything just so. The fascist regime in Germany rejected communism and also produced unimaginable mass killing. Western Europe and the US ultimately chose to retain some form of free market capitalism embedded within liberal democratic political regimes that imposed gradually regulatory schemes, progressive taxation, and a social safety net to care for those who could not or could no longer earn a living in a capitalist economy. Nearly every political or public policy argument in the US today seems to revolve around these questions, how much government regulation is best, how much taxation, how progressive taxation, and what kind of or how expensive or who pays for the social safety net. There has essentially been a convergence of Catholic ecumenical and evangelical social ethics in this arena around such principles as human dignity, solidarity, the common good, worries over consumerism and commodification, concern for capitalism's losers, global economic injustice, and so on. Most everyone agrees that there is little alternative today to some form of capitalism, but also that a morally blind and rapacious capitalism that loses a vision for anything other than profit ultimately devours people and itself. Evangelicals have contributed little of theoretical significance here, but have been effective in expressing biblically resonant concern for the domestic and global poor Offering innovations in poverty relief and economic development, we can be proud of those. And in attempting to protect social safety net programs for children, the poor, the sick, the aged. The goal of, of a full employment economy offering everyone the opportunity to do dignified work at a living wage, reducing income inequality, feeding everyone, and preventing easily preventable diseases, offering decent and affordable health care to all, regulating and taxing just enough but not too much, continues to elude us. But outside of ideological libertarians and a few surviving Marxists, contemporary Christian social teaching at least offers these shared goals, as well as significant programs that attempt to ameliorate some of the worst effects of global capitalism. Gay rights. Evangelical Christians have treated homosexuality as an issue in sexual ethics and have almost unanimously ruled out the moral legitimacy of any same-sex acts and relationships as part and parcel of our heterosexual marital sexual ethic. Today, the gay issue in US society is no longer an issue in sexual ethics. It has become a civil rights issue, an issue of social equality. Gays and lesbians have successfully made the transition from a hidden minority viewed as sexually deviant to a public minority viewed as civilly oppressed and making deeply American demands for access to equal civil rights along with others in such areas as military service, employment non-discrimination, and legal recognition of their intimate relationships. Evangelicals, together with Mormons and far more vocally than Catholics, have invested both a lot of money and a lot of political capital in increasingly unsuccessful efforts to block advances in gay rights. The tide is clearly turning in public opinion and in politics in favor of gay rights, including gay marriage, though patterns differ regionally. Um, Nate Silver in the New York Times this past week suggested that it, by 2020, 44 states will, will, would vote yes on a referendum for gay marriage. 44 states. Those opposed to such advances are increasingly seen as retrograde, retrograde and are sometimes compared to those who oppose civil rights for black Americans in the 1960s. It is not at all unthinkable that the tide will turn to such an extent that evangelical institutions that continue to discriminate against gays in admissions or hiring will face our own Bob Jones University moment in which our posture on these issues will lead to our social and legal delegitimation and loss of access to federal tax-exempt status with all of the symbolic and practical ramifications associated with that. Meanwhile, as Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman have shown, evangelical anti-gay rhetoric has increasingly cost us missionally and in the transmission of our faith to the next generation of our own children. Regardless of whether one is at all open to a reconsideration of Christian sexual ethics per se, 
many of the most important themes in Christian social ethics argue for evangelicals to at least reconsider our posture toward gay rights in society. Practical solidarity with the oppressed, radically inclusive community, a broad holistic sacredness of life vision, these are among the reasons why I personally have never been willing to join anti-gay public policy efforts. And we need to remember that everything we say and do about gay issues is heard. It's heard by a national gay community, by gay Christians hidden or out in our churches and in our schools, by family members and friends who love gay people, and by impressionable straight Christians who sometimes have found authorization for hatred and bullying in our anti-gay rhetoric, even when we are not shouting, even when we are quite polite. I personally recommend taking this issue off of the agenda of evangelical Christian public ethics, or even better, looking for areas in which we can stand in friendly solidarity with the efforts of the gay community that we can cooperate with, such as, for example, anti-bullying initiatives. Guns. I love what I do. This is so easy. <laughs> Guns. Bullets pierce the fragile human bodies that God so fearfully and wonderfully made wounding and killing those who are sacred in God's sight. In our country, that current rate of death by gunshot is 1,000 per month. There are at least two kinds of gun incidents that affect US society in a profound and disproportionate way as compared to other parts of the world. There are first the daily handgun killings that take one or two lives in cities each day like Chicago. The victims of these daily killings are mainly poor, urban, racial, ethnic minorities whose neighborhoods are deeply blighted by drugs and gangs and unemployment and violence and which we try to stay out of and care very little about what happens there, it seems, most of the time. And then there are the mass shootings which have become so terribly ubiquitous, usually involving an alienated young white man with an assault weapon killing large numbers of innocent people in some supposedly safe public place like a school, mall, or movie theater. And this is not to mention the daily suicides and domestic violence incidents and accidents that take so many lives among us. The only possible legitimate use of violent force is defensive. The Bible certainly offers grounds for suggesting that the responsibility for such legitimate defensive force belongs to the state rather than individuals. Most people in the 34% of US households that possess firearms today intend them for defensive and recreational purposes. But so often, these purposes are shattered. When a depressed person kills herself, when an angry person kills his estranged lover, when a homicidal, suicidal young man decides to make some sick kind of social statement at school or church. We are afflicted by a gun culture, perhaps traceable to our Revolutionary War roots and our Wild West heritage. We love our guns. We associate them with self-defense, justice, and even virility. The more we kill each other with guns, the more guns we buy to secure ourselves, and then the more guns we make available for further suicides and murders and violent rages and accidents. Christians surely can do better than this. Surely the sacredness of life, basic social justice, and the demands of peace lead us away rather than toward an adoration of guns or trust in guns for our security. Surely we can stand in solidarity with the thousands of victims of gun violence and against the gun makers and their lobby in Washington and state capitals. There is a deep cultural sickness here which we must address as Christians. Surely Christians should stand in support both of cultural change and of common sense gun control measures such as stricter background checks and looking at criminal and mental health records of anybody who buys a gun mandating smaller gun magazines and limiting, limiting military-style weapons in private hands. Immigration. Approximately 11 million human beings, primarily but not exclusively from Latin America, live illegally in the shadows of American society because they came here without documents or stayed here beyond the time permitted or perhaps were brought here as children by their parents. Many serve in the underground economy doing jobs that Americans don't want to do. They have no legal rights. They live in fear of arrest and deportations that shatter their families. Most came here because they simply wanted a better life. For at least a decade, policymakers have been attempting to solve the illegal immigration problem with solutions ranging from a proposed mass de deportation 
uh, to various legalization plans. Currently, the winds are blowing in a favorable direction for a relatively humane solution. A comprehensive plan involving a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants, together with efforts to block further illegal immigration and to assimilate undocumented immigrants into U.S. economic and political life, is gaining bipartisan steam. Elections do matter, don't they? Evangelicals are to be commended across the political spectrum for supporting comprehensive immigration reform. You should check out the Evangelical Immigration Table. It's very impressive. Perhaps this is the year that such a law will be passed, and if so, evangelicals will have played a significant role as part of a broader coalition of religious, civic, human rights, business, and law enforcement officials. And I have a paragraph on why we should do this theologically. How about I just use this line? Um, theologically, we are the kinds of people who are moved by the experience of inclusive border crossing community as when illegal immigrants worship with U.S. Christians in worship services directed toward the God of the Hebrew refugees and our refugee savior, Jesus, and his parents. Um, so there are theological reasons why Christians are doing pretty well on this issue. Torture. In less than two weeks, a blue ribbon panel called the Detainee Treatment Task Force, organized out of the Constitution Project in Washington, will report to the nation the results of our three-year inquiry into the U.S. treatment of suspected terrorist detainees since the Clinton years. I am on this panel, um, perhaps culminating my efforts to oppose detainee abuse by the United States, which uh, began when I started working on this issue in 2005, 2006. Our report essentially will say this. The United States was threatened by terrorists who targeted civilians. These terrorists did terrible damage, of course, most especially on 9-11. Policymakers were rightly aware of their responsibility for preventing and deterring future attacks. In wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and in global anti-terror operations, the U.S. government detained tens of thousands of suspected terrorists. In contravention of U.S. law, international law, and our treaty obligations, we abused many of these suspected terrorists and crossed the line to torture in a number of cases. This happens sometimes when soldiers and intelligence officers went beyond policy, but also sometimes when they attempted to follow policy as revised from the White House. The bulk of the abuses occurred at the hands of the CIA and its contractors, but responsibility for the revised policies goes to the top of the U.S. government, and there were abuses within the military. A primary way in which abuses and torture were justified was by a strategy of euphemism, in which a combination of abusive and torturous techniques was authorized under the term enhanced interrogation techniques. Most Christians do accept the defensive role of government, but too many Christians uncritically believed government and popular arguments that the demands of national defense in this new kind of war justified abusive measures that international and domestic observers of all types were at the time classifying as torture and that the Red Cross classified as torture when they investigated. Evangelicals polled as more open to, to the acceptance of torture than people of other faiths or no faith in the United States. And this, have, this polling result has been consistent. I consider this the most distressing polling result that I have ever seen in my 34 years as a Christian, and the most compelling reason I have ever encountered to renounce my connection to the American evangelical community. I continue to urge us to resist in the strongest possible manner any resort to torture in the future or today, or any moral legitimation of torture from anyone, even if they call it enhanced interrogation. This debate continues in public life. One reason elections matter is because of debates like this. Surely, as Christians, followers of the tortured Savior, we should know something about this. U.S. war making, two more issues. Am I doing okay on time? We are coming near the end of 12 years of war in Afghanistan. We have just passed the 10-year anniversary of our invasion and occupation of Iraq. The public debate about U.S. war making is shifting away from ground invasions to the propriety of drone warfare. Defense spending cuts in the context of a massive budget deficit may begin to constrain the freedom of U.S. policymakers to pursue aggressive military engagement around the world. Though do remember, that as of now, we have 1.4 million U.S. troops stationed in over 150 nations. We patrol the seas. We have a $700 billion military budget that is as large as the next 14 nations' military budgets put together. 
it can hardly be said that as of 2013, the U.S. has rolled back its massive military presence terribly far. And every time the Pentagon screams about its, the budget cuts, I don't weep a lot at this point, uh, given these numbers. In retrospect, the 20th century created the conditions for the United States to become an expansive military power and to create a bloated national security apparatus. We entered World War I very late. We got to contribute to Allied victory with relatively minimal losses. We entered World War II in 1941. We contributed again to Allied victory with much larger losses. We entered immediately into a global ideological geopolitical battle with the Soviet Union in which proxy wars and covert operations played a very large part. We built the Pentagon and the CIA, the National Security Agency, and undoubtedly a dozen clandestine services whose names we haven't even heard about yet. The power to wage war was increasingly centered in the executive branch. A volunteer, meaning paid military after Vietnam, localized the human cost of war to a tiny sliver of our population. Now significantly traumatized after the wars of this past decade, many of our soldiers serving four, five, six tours. The near seamless transition from a war on communism to a war on terror reinforced in us the habit of permanent war, open or clandestine. Our vast size and economic prosperity enabled us to afford a global military presence and massive national security bureaucracy with little difficulty. And we were convinced that all of our operations were good and just because, well, we're us. Christians have the theological and ethical resources to, to question all of this. But most evangelicals have been generally rather uncritical, the evangelical left excluded. If our leaders told us it was time to fight, we fought. If they told us there were weapons of mass destruction, we believed them. We provided and still provide a disproportionate number of US foot soldiers and a massive percentage of chaplains. With notable exceptions, we did not strongly protest the nuclear arms race with its threat of mass global war. The Christian right easily identified the US cause with God's cause and saw no problem with supporting constant US military engagements. Perhaps we lacked the critical distance to see the US the way that others did. International evangelicals provided dissonant perspectives if we would listen, one reason to be in touch with the global evangelical community. The challenge today is for evangelical Americans to lead the way in helping wean our nation off of its global pride and hegemony, gradually unraveling the national security bureaucracy and shrinking the size of the military, restoring greater democratic accountability to decision-making about war, including the use of drones, and denormalizing the permanent war footing that has come to characterize our way of life. In other words, I would say, we have come to identify what it means to be an American to be constantly at war. We don't know any other way. And Christians can help remind us that we can, this nation can be a nation that doesn't have to define itself in terms of war. Last issue, women's rights. I applaud the discovery of human trafficking issues by evangelicals and the strong role groups like International Justice Mission have played in fighting child and sex slavery here and around the world. Our newfound passion on trafficking has done us credit and it provides an entree into global, broader global women's rights issues, one might also say children's rights issues, if we will follow the thread of our own commitments. While we evangelicals were, or sometimes still are, fighting over whether women could be youth pastors, <laughs> we were mainly missing global women's rights concerns such as honor killings and bride burnings, sex selective abortions, neglect and infanticide of female babies and children, lack of access of ba to basic health care for women, easily preventable maternal mortality, gender-based violence against women, and lack of women's basic control over decisions such as whether and with whom to have sex, to marry, or to have children. Our more recent discovery of sex slavery ought to lead us into an engagement with the wider range of human rights violations against women and the very many ways in which women continue to be treated as less than fully human in many places in the world. This, in turn, should lead to a reconsideration of what still remains the common disdain for women's rights or feminist movements among many evangelicals. You can see the sneer on the lip when the language of feminist is used. And instead, we should appreciate those who have flown the flag of a genuinely evangelical feminism over the past three or four decades. When we learn about women who were routinely raped during war, or married against their will, or sold into sex slavery, or unable to get their unfaithful AIDS-infected husband to wear a condom during sex because they don't have enough power, 
or are denied access to an education or the ability to own property, or they cannot get decent medical care while delivering babies, perhaps we will be motivated to reconsider the gains that the feminist movement won for women here, our mothers, daughters, sisters, wives. Clearly, it is difficult to simultaneously oppose abortion on demand and support a global women's rights movement, which often supports abortion. But it is possible. I understand that when I attend the Women Deliver Conference in Kuala Lumpur in May, I will meet many Christian women's rights activists who take precisely this position. I call on evangelicals to become informed about the broad range of women's rights issues around the world and to engage these in the name of the sacred worth of every person in God's sight. Can I have two paragraphs to finish? Okay. I believe in a Christian public witness that stands in costly practical solidarity with those who are marginalized, whatever their gender, skin color, nationality, citizenship, or sexual orientation. I seek a Christian public witness that participates in Christ's kingdom of deliverance and justice, peace and healing and reconciled community. I hope for a winsome and holistic Christian public witness of broad range and political independence. I yearn for Christians to advance a comprehensive vision of the sacred worth of everybody in God's sight. In advancing such Christian public witness, we will need to partner with others of goodwill and similar goals, whether they are Christians or not. We will work for the common good and a renewed world, not for Christian privilege or cultural hegemony. We will demonstrate love for our nation, but always a critical patriotism. We will be grateful for democracy and make use of its access to power that we have with it, but aware of its deep vulnerability and its particular problems at any given moment. And we will know that our public words have little credibility apart from our ecclesial practices and our discipleship. We will pay attention to voices from outside our nation in order to help us see our own nation more clearly and live more faithfully. And we will remain calm, steadily pursuing our public witness, trusting in God's sovereignty and the certainty that one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Thank you very much.